Hello again. Welcome to spring. You know, with the warm weather, what else arrives? Mosquitoes. Yes. I got you trained well, right? <laughs> mosquitoes are coming. They're starting to hatch. Speaking of mosquitoes, today we are going to talk about emerging viruses. What is an emerging virus? It is a virus that causes a new infection that we've never seen before, or it causes something that we haven't seen in a while, or it's slightly different from how we used to see it. Those are all terms that work for emerging viruses. And the term arose in the 90s. I'm not sure exactly who coined it, but of course, Emerging viruses are not new. They have always been emerging. We just didn't see them until very recently. Probably since humans began congregating in numbers to sustain epidemics of infection, probably that is when they began to emerge. And as I said, we've recently become very good at detecting them, so I think we pick up more of them, but there's no question that as the population increases, we become more mobile. We do all kinds of other things that we'll talk about today. We are increasing the number of emerging infections as well. Needless to say, the public and the press are fascinated by emerging viruses. There's a Newsweek cover from, what, 19, 1995, after an Ebola outbreak. You know, there are lots of books written about outbreaks. There are Hey, there's even movies about outbreaks, too. Contagion is one. There's one called Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman. If I assigned you that for extra credit, it would be a piece of cake because it's so crappy. And there are lots of others that involve viruses, too. So people are obsessed with this idea of pathogens coming out of nowhere and wiping out lots of people. The press is obsessed with it as well. So that's what an emerging virus is, something new or quasi-new. An emerging virus, as I said, it's, has an expanded, it could have an expanded host range, and we see new diseases. So we've seen vir this virus before. Zika is a great example of that. We knew it was around since 1947, but suddenly it changes the kind of disease that it causes. And these are typically transmission of a virus from a animal to humans. We call that a zoonosis. When we pick up animal infections, it's called a zoonosis. Some of these emerging viruses continually are zoonoses. So Ebola, every outbreak of Ebola is a zoonosis because it's a new crossover from an animal to a human. That virus never seems to become established in the human population so that it becomes a human virus. Of course, it does happen sometimes. As we'll see next time, SIV moved from chimps into humans, and now it's a human virus. There was one jump for the main group of HIV, and then it became adapted to spread among humans. Obviously, measles and polio and smallpox, those all jumped into humans a long time ago and became adapted so that we now call them human viruses. So this is an important concept for you. A crossover event, a zoonosis, can occur multiple times, or it can become established as a human virus. And of course, fever is, the, is a description of one such emergence. I think this is the first one we really noticed in the terms of this concept of emerging viruses. Back in the late 60s, this Lassa virus emerged in Nigeria. And since then, we have called these emerging viruses. Of course, influenza viruses were emerging before that, but we didn't see it as such. We didn't get this idea that there's a whole pool of viruses out there infecting animals and that we, we can catch them. And sometimes, and this is really rare, they adapt to us and become human viruses. So we're going to talk today about some of the principles involved in emerging viruses. And then I want to give you a bunch of examples to illustrate some of the more recent ones so you can understand the principles. Here is an interesting pie chart that I found 
in a book called One Health by ASM Press, and it shows this human-animal interface in terms of virus infections. So each of these numbers are genera of different viruses. So poliovirus is a genus, Ebola virus is a genus, and these are just the numbers that fall into these different categories. For example, zoonotic pathogens, that's 37, that's the biggest one. These are viruses that every time they infect us, it's a new jump from an animal. So Ebola virus is an example of that. MERS coronavirus, in order to cause a new outbreak, there's a brand new jump, so it remains a zoonosis. So there are 37 of those. And then we have two other categories, adapted or heirloom pathogens. It's a quaint name, isn't it, an heirloom. It's something we've inherited from either other Homo sapiens older than we are or before Homo sapiens species, our ancestors. And uh, that is shown by the less than or greater than. So we have those numbers there. Those are heirlooms that we've inherited. So in other words, these were zoonoses for an older Homo sapiens or maybe an ancestor of Homo sapiens, and they've been passed on down to us. And then we have adapted pathogens. Those are the viruses that came into Homo sapiens and have remained with us, and that includes poliovirus and measles virus and smallpox virus, etc. We talked about the origins of some of those being tens of thousands of years ago. And that fits within the timeline of Homo sapiens development. So as I said last time, the viruses we have today, they came from either us, Homo sapiens, our ancestors, or other animals. There's nowhere else to get them. They don't come from outer space. They come from things that are on this planet. In recent years, I would say, I don't know, the last hundred years or so, we have been making it easier for animal viruses to infect us. We do all sorts of things that we didn't realize would make this easier, but they do, and that includes globalization, the ability to get anywhere in the world relatively quickly, huge population growth, and with a lot of that associated with poverty and people living in poor conditions that facilitate the spread of infections. Deforestation, so you can have farms, but the deforestation contributes because you have to go in the forest to deforest it, and those people are exposed to new pathogens. All sorts of environmental changes. And of course, we change ecosystems. And on top of all this is evolution of viruses, which we talked about last time. Huge diversity in just a single host. So any new opportunities are grounds for selection of new viruses. So these are all things that we do today. And we didn't do most of these, you know, 100 years ago. So I would say that the number of emerging infections, while they were still there, they were fewer. And as we go further and further back and have smaller and smaller groups of Homo sapiens, they get less and less because there simply isn't an opportunity to get a virus from an animal as often. And this is one of the main overriding factors in the emergence of new infections, the huge population growth. Look at that, you know, 7 billion people today, but look at the amazing growth of the population uh, just in the past recent years. And so this growth has multiple impacts on the planet. It alters the planet completely, but it also provides multiple opportunities for us to acquire viruses from different animals. Just as an example, to really hammer this home, this idea that every animal out there has a collection of viruses that could in principle be passed on to us if we have contact with them. Now here in New York City, you could get a brand new virus infection because you think, well, there's not much wildlife here and et cetera, but can you think of an example of a emerging infection that actually emerged here in New York City? West Nile virus emerged in Queens and in the Bronx Zoo was first found here. It came to New York City. It's not because someone went into Central Park and picked it up from a raccoon. You can get rabies here in Central Park. 
but they got bitten by a mosquito in Queens and in the Bronx Zoo. So all these insidious ways of getting viruses can happen here or they can happen in the jungle. And speaking of the jungle, here's the Amazon North region of Brazil. Now this picture is a few years old now, right? There's Brazil, North region up top, where you know a lot of deforestation is unfortunately ongoing. But these words that you can't see very well here are the names of different viruses that have been found throughout the Amazon North. And some of these have been isolated uh, at an institute in Brazil. But again, these are not human viruses. These are viruses that circulate in the animals that live in the forests. So as you go in there, the potential is you can pick up one of these. Just the fact that there are so many and there are not that many emerging infections, really, when you think about it, tells you how rare these jumps are. So workers going in here, in theory, could become infected. Then maybe they will go home and bring the virus with them. But it just doesn't happen all that often. I mean, there are certainly some emerged viruses that have come from this region. But there are far fewer than the number of viruses out there. So that's something you should remember. It's a really rare event for a virus to jump from an animal to humans, but everything we have has done that, so that, those rare events add up. Here are some of the viruses that I would say emerged at one time or another or fit into this definition of an emerging infection. So here we have the virus on the left, the family in the middle, and on the right, the drivers of the emergence of these viruses. And we're gonna talk about some of these today, we have already talked about West Nile virus, where the driver for emergence was a mosquito. As far as we can tell, that was the same for Zika virus. We've talked about dengue virus quite a bit. This has reemerged in the past 20 or 30 years. We almost got rid of it in certain parts of the world, and then we stopped using DDT, and the mosquitoes came back. Ebola virus, a factor is human contact with the natural host of the virus, bushmeat trade. As we will see, bats play a role in a lot of these crossovers. We'll talk about Hendra and Nipah virus today. Next time we'll talk about HIV, which also involves bushmeat trade. So going into the forest to get your meal, which a lot of people do because there, there's no place to buy food, is a risk factor because those animals you hunt have infections of their own. And the two coronaviruses probably, well, the, the original SARS for sure had a risk factor of open meat markets and bats and the, the more recent coronavirus, camel human contact. All right, so we will go through some of these today and explain in detail how these crossovers worked. So don't forget that evolution has a major role here. There is a reason why this lecture is after the evolution lecture, that because evolution provides you with the understanding of the huge diversity among viruses and how it's generated, and importantly, the quasi-species, which means that anything that you acquire from an animal is going to be a mixture of different sequences. Among that quasi-species could be the one viral genome that is good enough to infect the different hosts. So out there, there are all sorts of animals. And these are just some of the ones that play roles in crossovers that we know of. Bats, pigs, ducks, and other water birds for influenza viruses, chimpanzee for HIV, the deer mouse for C. nombre virus and MERS coronavirus camels. So again, in each of these animals, there exists quasi-species of these viruses, which are poised to go into a new host if that opportunity arises, and the right genome can be selected for. And that's a major advance in our understanding of what happens, because if there were one genome and it didn't vary very much, it would be really hard for it to jump from one species to another. Of course, if it didn't vary, it wouldn't exist either. It wouldn't have the fitness to be able to exist at all. Now, the interactions of viruses with their hosts, we can put into four categories, and they're shown here, the general interactions. And this is, this is a good framework for understanding a zoonosis versus a stable, long-term 
infection like polio virus or measles virus. So we have stable interactions. And that, again, polio virus, measles virus, smallpox before it was eradicated. This kind of interaction of virus and host maintains the virus. So we have an evolving interaction. This is when virus passes to a naive population that has never seen it before. It could be the same host. It could be Zika going from Africa to the Pacific Islands where it's never been before. Or it could be smallpox going from the old world to the new world brought by colonizers. Or it could be a different host. It could be Ebola virus going from an animal in the forest to a human. So that is an evolving because as the virus goes into the new population, it changes very rapidly. So those are roots of emerging infections going from a stable to an evolving situation. So the virus would be stable in its original host and becomes evolving in its new host. We have dead end interactions. This is a one-way passage to a different species. And that species may come, become infected, but it doesn't go beyond that. For example, Ebola, I would say, is a dead end infection because eventually the transmission is not sustainable among people. The, as you'll see, the only reason Ebola virus chains of transmission occur is because of families where infected individuals get together or healthcare situations. And then we have an, a resistant host where infection is blocked. The virus never gets anywhere there. And that's the vast majority of interactions that we have with animal viruses. They get in, they either don't find a suitable cell, they are eliminated by the immune response, and that's the end of the infection. So let's look at these in some detail individually. Here's stable host virus interactions. By definition, both components survive and multiply, the virus and the host. The virus multiplies and moves on to a new host. Enough hosts survive. And some of these are permanent. As far as we can tell, at least within the history that we know of, measles, herpes simplex, human cytomegalovirus, smallpox, those are viruses that only infect people as long as we have known. Sometimes the humans are not the only host for these viruses. So influenza viruses can infect both humans and a variety of other animals. Birds, water birds in particular, but also chickens, pigs, seals, flaviviruses, of course, can infect all sorts of primates. So it need not be just humans to be a stable interaction. It could be humans, humans and other virus, uh, other animals, or just other animals, of course. We don't know much about the infections that go on in the wild. People do isolate viruses from a variety of sources, and it's very interesting what they find. But for the most part, we don't really know what the hosts are or the effect on the host. You know, this whole course is really human-centric. We know little about the, the viruses of other animals out there. Let's look at the evolving host-virus relationship. And this is an example where a virus goes into a new host. It could be same species or a different species. This typically is unstable and unpredictable. You just don't know what's going to be the outcome of this. Smallpox and measles introduction by old world colonists is a great example. These, of course, didn't exist in the new world. They were brought over by colonists and introduced, and they wiped out many, many millions of inhabitants of the Americas. West Nile virus into the Western Hemisphere right here in New York City. No, had never been here before. As far as we could tell, no one was immune, so it took off. And of course, the introduction of uh, rabbits into Australia and putting the virus into those rabbits. Those rabbits had never seen that particular virus, and so in that first year, it was quite lethal. So that's an evolving host virus relationship. Dead end is a frequent outcome. So you go from you could go from a stable to a dead end. It could be stable in one species and then jump over to another, but it could also go from an evolving infection into a different species. There is no sustained transmission in a dead end. And as I said, it includes Ebola viruses where 
probably somewhere in the forest there's a reservoir. We're not quite sure what it is, maybe bats, and occasionally it's spread to chimps and gorillas and eventually to humans. So humans, chimps, and gorillas all seem to be dead-end hosts for Ebola viruses. H5N1 is an avian influenza virus that infects birds. It is lethal to the chicken industry. It will wipe out whole entire flocks of chickens and turkeys. And occasionally, it infects people, particularly people who care for chickens. They can be infected. It, will, it is often lethal, but it does not transmit among humans. So this is another example of a dead end infection. So they contribute very little to the spread of an infection, even though they make the news and, you know, when people die of Ebola infections, it's all we hear about. But really, in the bigger scheme of things, this virus is in the forest spreading among its natural hosts. And what humans do nothing to the ecology of those infections. So here are some examples of these stable and dead-end interactions with one virus. Here we have an arbovirus. Arbovirus simply means a virus that is transmitted by arthropod vectors, could be mosquitoes or ticks. And here is one where this particular virus has a stable host virus interaction with wild birds, among which it is transmitted by mosquitoes. So wild birds are bitten by mosquitoes, which then go on to bite another bird, and they have a cycle of infection and reinfection uh, among them. And this can also involve chickens, as you can see here. It can involve other mammals and birds. So these can be very complicated cycles with bifurcations at multiple steps. The mosquitoes can go off and bite other animals. They can also involve other mosquitoes and other hosts as well. So this can get to be quite a web of interactions. And as I said, we don't really study these all that much. It's all out there, and it would be very interesting to look at, but we don't. Now, occasionally for these arboviruses, the mosquitoes encounter other hosts, and they will bite them, take a blood meal, and deliver virus. And two shown here for arboviruses are horses or humans. A dead end simply means the virus is delivered to them. It will replicate. It may cause disease, but it is not spread to another host. That's what we're talking about with a dead end. It is replicating, causing disease, but not spread. Here's another example of a stable and dead-end mixture. We have a tick-borne encephalitis virus, European tick-borne encephalitis virus, which is spread among rodents. So rodents are the natural host for this particular virus. They spread it by biting and taking blood meals, of course. And on this is an interesting sidebar, transovarial transmission. So if the virus infects the eggs of the tick, those eggs, when they hatch into a new tick, will have the virus with them. Occasionally, the ticks will bite uh, other animals, including goats, as you see here, and humans. These are dead-end hosts. There have also been transmissions documented of humans consuming goat milk and getting the virus from the milk itself. The humans develop disease, but they do not spread the disease to others. So again, that's the classic example of a dead-end host. Here are some flaviviruses just to expand on this. And here we have a phylogenetic tree, which is based on the genome sequences of these viruses. And they are arranged according to the reservoir or amplifying host and the vector. So at the top, we have viruses. These are human pathogens, but they have, again, natural hosts in nature. At the top are viruses spread by Culex mosquitoes, and these are the reservoir are birds, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis. Humans are accidental hosts for these viruses. So West Nile is not spread from human to human. You get the infection. When you're bitten by a mosquito that has taken a blood meal from a bird. Same with those other encephalitis viruses. In the middle, we have viruses for whom primates seem to be the reservoir. They're spread by 80s mosquitoes. They include dengue viruses, Zika, yellow fever virus. So yellow fever virus 
in its original incarnation, it was encountered during the construction of the Panama Canal. And the workers were getting sick, and many of them were dying. So Walter Reed went down to figure out what was going on, and he figured out that it was an infectious agent, something spread by mosquitoes. So they got rid of the mosquitoes, and that allowed the canal to be made. But those mosquitoes were spreading virus from a primate vector in the forest to humans. Now, more contemporary yellow fever can happen without a monkey reservoir. It can be spread from human to human. So some of these viruses will go human to human. Same as with dengue as well. Dengue, there are cases where the virus will spread from a monkey to humans, but it can also go human to human. So when we talk about an emerging infection, there are two really main and general st steps. And we've already talked about this. First, you have to encounter the virus, or it has to be introduced into a new host. So that requires you either to go somewhere where the viruses may be, in forests, if you're going to deforest the Amazon, going there, or you can just go to the Bronx Zoo and encounter a new virus. It doesn't have to be an exotic location. And then the virus, in order to become an emerging infection, it has to become established in its new host and disseminated. In this course, as I said, we only talk about human infections, or mostly, and in fact, in terms of emerging infections, we mainly talk about humans, but there must be emerging infections going on in animals. There must be a one species that has a virus in the forest that encounters another and spreads its infection. Well, we don't, we don't ever hear about that, of course, because there are no newspapers reporting these incidents among animals, and maybe they don't interact all that much except for predation. But it would be really interesting to know to what extent emerging viruses happen to non-humans. So what we're going to talk about today are mainly us acquiring viruses. And in order for them to infect us and to go on, they have to be not only introduced, but they have to become established. As I said, we do lots of things that facilitate interactions with new sources of viruses. And some of them are listed here. You know, making dams and water impoundments encourage breeding of mosquitoes. Lots of examples of that. Irrigation, same thing. Deforestation for agricultural purposes. You have to go in to deforest. That, that, that way you encounter new viruses. Rerouting of migration patterns so that new animals will contact different people. Wildlife parks. Long distance transport of livestock and birds. This is a huge contributor. There's a, you know, there's a fungus right now that is killing off frogs globally. That is spread entirely by the frog trade. Millions of frogs are shipped around the world for pets, and you ship a fungus in a frog into a new area where the fungus has never been. We're making an outbreak in the frog. So I, there's an example of emerging infection in a non-human in a frog, but it's not a virus. Air travel, urbanization, daycare centers. In, in the old days, kids stayed at home. One of the parents took care of them. Now both parents work. You put them in daycare where there are 50, 100 other kids. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to spread infections. Hot tubs. 100 years ago, there were probably no hot tubs. Now we have hot tubs. And if you don't chlorinate them properly, you're going to pass infection. Air conditioning is very interesting. This can be a negative influence because you stay inside and you don't get bitten by mosquitoes. And that's one of the reasons why dengue in Mexico goes right up to the U.S. border. You rarely see it in Texas. It must be the wall, right? <laughs> you rarely see it in Texas because as soon as you cross the border, everybody's inside at night. They have screens on their windows, air conditioning. But you go down into Mexico, at night if it's hot, they sit out on their porch and they get bitten by mosquitoes. So it's a lifestyle change. Use tires, of course, spread mosquitoes. Then Blood transfusion. HIV was totally spread globally before we knew it was in the blood. It's just unbelievable. We'll talk about that next time. And of course, drug use and sex will spread lots of infectious diseases. So as I said, there are rare encounters with new hosts. Most of them we never detect. I mean, you may go on vacation somewhere and get a new virus and never know it. It never replicates in you, or if it does, it doesn't cause any symptoms. It's never transmitted. You may be infected. You may feel slightly weird, maybe flu-like symptoms, and it's over. You never transmit it. Some of them do take off, and as I said, they have been rare. 
if it's going to happen, the virus that you acquire has to find a susceptible and permissive cell. And of course, if you're going to spread it, you can't be living alone in the woods because you're not going to spread it to anyone. So you have to live with other people or near or encounter other people. You have to go to work or you have to go to wherever school or whatever it is that you do. And so that's the only way that these infections are going to endure because they will find serial hosts. So if a virus goes from a mouse to a human, that human has to encounter others to get the infection going. And as you'll see when we talk about some examples, that's what happens in all of them. There's always a chain of transmission. Otherwise, we would never hear about it. If it happened in one person, we wouldn't hear about it. And we actually have some interesting examples to come up where not a lot of people are involved, yet we're looking so hard now for new viruses that we pick them up. So let's start to talk about specific examples. And the oldest one, of course, are diseases spread by exploration and colonization. And these mimic what happens today when a virus goes into a naive population. So smallpox is one example. Remember last time we said smallpox probably emerged about 15,000 years ago when maybe a virus jumps from a, a gerbil into humans. This happened in the Middle East, and it had to have happened in places where there are enough humans to sustain transmission. It couldn't happen with just a few people around because it would end right there. So it established itself when urban centers were growing. It spread to Europe, caused huge epidemics. You can read about these in the literature. People didn't know what they were, but they're very characteristic because of the rash, and it looks very much like smallpox. And of course, as explorers then went across the Atlantic, they brought the virus with them. The virus emerged in the Middle East. It did not emerge in North and South America. It just simply wasn't there. They had their own viruses there, of course. And when Cortez brought it over, that, that ended up killing millions of Aztecs. It contributed to his conquering because he had a very small band of soldiers, as you know. And here's a painting showing you know, people dying of smallpox. Here's the typical rash. So this is a perfect illustration of bringing a virus to a naive population. This, this was an emerging infection for the Aztecs, in this case, and many other Native Americans. It was a human-delivered virus, but that doesn't matter in our definition of emerging infections. So these have been happening as long as there have been lots of people around. This is another one. This is one of my favorites. This is poliovirus. And here the driver is changes in human populations and environments. We've known about poliomyelitis for thousands of years. This is an Egyptian carving from thousands of years B.C., and it's thought that this is a priest with a, you can see a, a withered leg and a dropped foot. This is totally characteristic of paralysis caused by poliovirus. So from that point on, we can see in the historical record, recordings of polio here and there. It was very clear, but there were never any big outbreaks. It was a case here, a case there, and it was clearly poliomyelitis. So somehow this virus got into humans at some point. We don't know when. We have no idea what the origins of this particular virus and established a stable host virus relationship, case here, a case there. But at the beginning of the 20th century, all of a sudden, outbreaks. A hundred here, a few hundred there, thousands here in New York City in the 20s and 30s. What changed? And this would be considered an emerging infection today. Back then, we didn't call it that. All we noticed is that something was different. But what changed? And I always like to say, if we, if we were studying this today, we would blame it on mutation. We would say the virus mutated. But what happened was, until the beginning of the 20th century, every baby got infected within the first few weeks of life because sanitation was abysmal. You know, here in New York City, people threw their sewage into the street. It was piled with human feces and horse feces. It was just a, a disaster. And of course, kids got infected with everything early on, but they didn't get paralyzed. Why? Because they had their mother's antibody protection. Remember, the antibody is passively transferred from the mother into the baby, so the baby's protected for a couple of months. So if you get poliovirus, it's neutralized. So that protected kids. What happened? 
well, about the turn of the 20th century, we invented the toilet, one of the greatest inventions in human history. It makes us, in part, what we're able to do today. Otherwise, we die in our 30s. Keep the sewage away from us. That delayed infection. So no longer were babies infected in the first few months of life. They didn't get infected till they were three, four, five years old. And then there were thousands and thousands of susceptible kids in cities. You put a virus in, boom, you have an outbreak of polio. We call polio a disease of modern sanitation. That's the outbreak curve. You can see little blip, nothing until late 1890s. And then all of a sudden, big outbreak, thousands of cases a year, and then tens of thousands of cases. Very clearly, this explains the different epidemiology. So this is an emerging infection by today's definition. It had one pattern, a sporadic cases here and there, and then all of a sudden became epidemic. And we can say that it was sanitation, improved sanitation, ironically, which causes this. As I said, today we would say the virus mutated. So that is a wonderful example of how the pattern of disease changes with the environment. Bats are a huge source of zoonotic infections. It turns out that bats have lots of different viruses in them. People have looked at the virome of bats. It's really huge. They, must, they have really good immune systems because when they fly, they generate lots of oxygen radicals which would damage their tissues, so they have dealt with this. And people have sequenced bat genomes, and they have amplification of proteins that deal with these oxygen radicals. So that enhanced immune system must also protect them from virus infections. And we're learning that many viruses can jump from bats to humans. So here are two examples. These are two paramyxoviruses. For some reason, there are lots of paramyxoviruses in bats. If you look at the virome, you find an inordinate number of them. Of course, paramyxoviruses are like measles virus. They're enveloped negative strand RNA viruses. And this is a flying fox. This bat has a wingspan about like my hands here. It's a big animal. They have been recently found to transmit two different paramyxoviruses, Nipah and Hendra viruses, which infect domestic animals and humans. So this is another pattern in emergence. Sometimes the virus will go into an animal that has contact with the source, in this case a bat, and then from the animals into humans. So Nipah was first found in Malaysia in 1998, never seen before. We never saw this virus. All of a sudden in 1998, we have an outbreak on a pig farm. The pigs were developing not only respiratory disease, but neurological disease. A million pigs were killed to stop this outbreak. They just dug big pits and pushed all the pigs into them. And 105 humans who had contact with the pigs, it was a pig farm. You're growing pigs for meat. You have to have humans to take care of the pigs. They're contacting them. They got infected. 100 of them died. Where did this virus come from? Well, we found out that fruit bats are infected with this virus called Nipah virus. They excrete virus in the urine. They seem to be fine, though. So this virus has been with bats probably a long period of time. It's in a stable host virus relationship with the bats. Pig farmers in these areas, they plant mango trees near their pig pens. The bats at night come and feed on the mangoes. The mangoes will fall. They're contaminated with urine from the bats. They have virus in them. Pigs eat the mangoes, and they get infected, and then the pigs spread the infections to humans. So we figured this out, and we were able to stop those outbreaks. But subsequently, there have been outbreaks in India and Bangladesh, and it was traced to the consumption of date palm sap. A date palm is a tree. People put in collectors. So you put a, just like a maple tree, you would collect maple syrup. You collect the syrup in a container, and you leave these on all night. And at night, the bats come, and they like it too. They like the date palm sap, but of course they urinate in it and they put virus in it. And then unsuspectingly you come in the morning and you drink it and you get infected. So they figured this out and the simple solution was what? What do you think? The low tech, kind of like putting screens on windows to prevent mosquito transmission of viruses. What would be the low tech solution? You cover it. You put a cover on and that takes care of the problem. The bats can't get it and they can't contaminate it. You know, you can have a low-tech solution and someone's going to not do it, right? Because 
that always happens. So there's still cases in India and Bangladesh. There's a little bit of human to human transmission. And part of the problem there is that in these countries, you know, if someone dies, there's a ceremony where you prepare the body. And that's how other people can get infected. So it's very difficult to tell people, do not prepare your body in your traditional way. The same thing happens in, in Africa with Ebola outbreaks, but we're working on trying to do that. The other paramyxovirus is Hendra. This was discovered in Australia. Hendra is a suburb of Brisbane here on the east coast of Australia. And this was discovered on a farm that took care of racehorses. Virus got into racehorses. It killed 14 of them. It killed a trainer who used to take care of the racehorses. And what happened here, again, flying foxes were found to be near the farm where the horses were being kept. Somehow they got into the stable. They contaminated the stable with urine. The horses picked it up. They got infected. And then the trainers taking care of the horses. You get close to a horse, right? You can easily get respiratory secretions. They transmitted it to humans. This is still happening from time to time. There are uh, outbreaks, but a vaccine has been developed now. And this is a vaccine for horses. Makes perfect sense. There's so few human infections, and the risk factor are the horses. And there are not so many horses out there, more, many more humans than racehorses. And so you can immunize the horses. Not only will it protect them, but it protects humans as well. This is called a one world health solution. One world is the word which means we're all in this together. Humans and animals, we're all in it together. So if we protect one of the two, depending on which way transmission goes, we can protect everyone. So in this case, we vaccinate horses and we protect humans. So on this map, this blue line is the range of the flying foxes, the bats that carry these viruses. So they're in red. Those are where we have seen Hendra virus outbreaks in Australia. Besides the original in Hendra, there are some further up on the coast. The Nipah virus outbreaks initially in Malaysia, India, and Bangladesh as well. But these, these flying foxes have a big range, as you can see by the blue line. So it's potential that there could be infected flying foxes elsewhere. A couple of years ago, I went to Australia. And there is a, a town nearby called Geelong, which has a BSL-4 laboratory. It's where they developed the Hendra vaccine for horses, actually. I visited it, and this fellow used to work there, Lin Fa Wang. He works on bats and bat viruses. So I did a little interview with him in his office. This is the real Batman. It's really cool stuff. It's a couple of years old now, but it's worth a listen to hear about bats. And, you know, they're trying to raise bat colonies to study them. The interesting thing is, you know, this, this idea that their immune system is really pumped up because they fly. In a lab, they, they don't fly because they're in little cages. So there's that part of it is missing. They can't study that. That was encounter with bats and things that humans do, like pig farms and racehorses. Now let's talk about how climate can affect and drive emerging infections. And this is the story of a disease called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. As you can tell by the name, it is a respiratory disease, very severe disease, lethal in many of the initial patients, first found in the Four Corners area of New Mexico in the early 90s. So that's the place where the four states come together. People were dying of severe respiratory disease that seemed atypical. Eventually, a virus was isolated from these patients. It was called C. nombre virus. And it turns out this virus is endemic in the deer mouse. It's a little mouse called Paramiscus maniculatus. They carry this virus, and they're fine. And if you just sample mice randomly, 30% of them are positive for this virus. So if you're doing any kind of project in a laboratory, I went to visit a guy in Vermont once who was capturing deer mice, wild deer mice. You have to be very careful because if 30% of them are positive for this virus, you can get infected. So that's the virus that was found to cause it. It's present in mice. So how did, why, why all of a sudden did we have this outbreak? I'll tell you. But first, let me tell you that it was first isolated 
near a place called Muerto Canyon. So the CDC likes to name viruses according to where they come from. But in this case, the residents said, we don't want a virus named after our town because people won't come here. So they tried a couple of different names, and no one liked them. So they ended up calling it Sin Nombre, no name virus, which is a little, little joke, right? All right, so these are bunyaviruses. Hantaviruses are envelope virus with an RNA genome in three segments, S, medium, and large, negative stranded RNA. What happened here was in this year of the first outbreaks, there was a lot of rain, more so than in any other year. And one of the things that are grown in this area are pignon nuts. People like to eat pignon nuts, but so do the mice. And so with the increased rainfall, we had increased crops of pignon nuts and more mice because there was more food for the mice to eat. The mice invaded people's houses. When there's lots of mice out there, they come into your house and they defecate and urinate in your house. And the virus is present in feces and urine. And as it dries, if you vacuum it, it becomes aerosolized, you can breathe it in. And it will infect you. So we are not the natural hosts. These mice are the natural hosts. But this year, with the rain increased, increased the pignon nuts, it increased the mouse numbers. They came in our houses, and they put virus. They left virus behind, which infected people. So here we have the mouse excreting virus, which which we inhale. And this is a good reason why, if you if you see in your house mouse shit, which you can recognize as the little pointy pellets. Do not vacuum it up. Spray it to wet it and then sweep it up. Because if you vacuum it, it's going to aerosolize. And there is some paramiscus in New York State. Maybe not here in New York City, New York State, certainly out on Long Island. So just be careful. It turns out that we've seen this infection since the 50s with this particular virus. We just didn't recognize what it was. But now there are more infections occurring. Here's a map of the latest numbers there have been 728 infections documented since 1993 in the U.S. You can see mostly in these western states, the darker colors have the most cases. It is spread by Paramiscus maniculatus, which is the deer mouse. And this is the range of the deer mouse. So there's some in upstate New York. It can also be spread by the uh, white-footed mouse, the rice rat, and the cotton rat. We also get cases where people go camping and they, they camp on those platforms. You put your tent on the platform and the mice have been underneath it. Their feces gets aerosolized and you inhale it. There have been some outbreaks in upstate New York in tenting situations like that. There was one a couple of years ago at Yosemite. So in other, in other words, be careful if you're camping as well because you could be inhaling hantavirus. I mean, it's not huge risk, right? But you don't want it to be you. Here's another one, which is far more rare. This is called Heartland Virus Disease. It was discovered in 2012. So two farmers in Missouri came to the hospital. They were sick. Nobody could figure out what was wrong with them. Nothing worked to make them better. And somehow this case got the attention of CDC. Otherwise, it would never have been picked up. But it turned out these farmers had ticks on them all day long. They worked out in the fields. They were always bitten by ticks. And so uh, eventually they, they uh, identified a new bunyavirus, similar to hantavirus, but, but clearly different, which was vectored by Lone Star ticks. And so far we've had 30 cases, mostly in these states shown here on the map in purple. And this is a great example of how this has probably been around for ages. But, you know, it causes severe fever, thrombocytopenia, and other things can do the same thing. So no one ever figured out to distinguish the viral causes from other causes. And only because of new technology, the ability to sequence very quickly from these specimens from these farmers, were we able to figure out what it was. Now let's talk about Ebola. This is a virus that caused a big outbreak not too long ago in West Africa. It was first identified in 1976. There were two outbreaks, one in DRC and one in Sudan, 300 and 280 cases. And this is the first time this virus had been seen. The index case in Sudan was a cotton factory worker. Uh, and this was spread 
among family members by the use of contaminated needles. The virus was isolated and named after a small river in the northwestern DRC, which is right by that red dot there, the Ebola River. That's where the virus got its name with. So apparently they were okay with naming a virus after their locale. These are all the outbreaks of Ebola virus disease we have seen since that first one in the DRC. The size of the circle tells you how many people were infected. You can see there was a big period of nothing, then suddenly again in the 90s cases throughout Africa. And finally, the last one in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, 28,000 cases, bigger than any of them before. As you can see, the biggest one, I guess, was Uganda. 40% mortality. So 40% of the infected people died. So this is a virus you have to work on under BSL-4 conditions. This is a laboratory of the highest biological containment. I had the ability to visit one in Boston a number of years ago, and that's what you have to do. You put on a space suit, and you have to have air pumped in. And we shot a video here. Uh, it's a nice hour-long documentary which explains how you work <coughs> in such labs. The one in Boston wasn't open at the time, which is why we could get in and film, because otherwise you're not allowed to go in unless you've been extensively trained. It's very cool. It's a concrete cube within a bigger building, and the, the engineering is just amazing. Anyway, to work on viruses like Ebola, for which it's transmitted person to person, there's high mortality, there's no vaccines or antivirals, you have to do that. This is Ebola virus. It's a filamentous virus we have encountered before, negative strand RNA genome which encodes for a number of, of different proteins. So this was unique morphology when it was first identified. This is a classic zoonosis. We get infected by contact with animals. The index case is typically contact with an animal carcass, bush meat, going in the woods to get meat, although we don't always identify the index case. Uh, it's transmitted to others by close contact. So you bring some bush meat into your house and everyone eats it and they all get infected. Chains of, of infection are rather short. The R0 is two, so one person infects two others on average. These viruses are thought to originate in bats. So the Ebola virus and Marburg virus are both filoviruses. Marburg virus was identified slightly before Ebola in monkeys that were shipped from Africa to a German primate laboratory in Marburg, Germany. People started getting very sick and dying. The monkeys were dying as well. And that's where Marburg virus came from. That virus has been isolated from a fruit bat. As far as Ebola virus goes, we've gotten RNA from bats. We have antibodies. We do not have infectious virus from any bat of Ebola virus yet. So whether that is the reservoir remains to be seen. We think that humans, gorillas, and chimps are dead end host. They get infected from a bat, probably the gorillas and the chimps contact the bat, and then humans contact the gorillas or the chimps. So that's the origin of Ebola viruses. We think bats are likely to be the reservoir. It's, they are transmitted among bats. Whether it hurts them or not, we don't know, because we can't really study it in the wild. And then these bats transmit to chimps, Gorillas, maybe other animals as well, they may transmit it among themselves. And humans can acquire it from these animals and maybe even from bats as well. Here are two examples of the outbreaks, one in Gabon in 96, 37 cases. A chimpanzee found dead in the forest was eaten by people hunting for food. It was dead, but it's food for them. 18 people who were involved in the butchering became sick and then they infected their family members. If you identify this, you can go in and isolate the people and reduce the transmission. Otherwise, they'll, they'll go out and go about their lives and contact other people and really spread it. Another one in 96, 96, 97, 60 cases. The index case, there was a hunter who lived in a forest camp and a dead chimp was found at the time infected, although there was not evidence that he had had contact with this chimp. The most recent outbreak in 20. 14 was huge, that's the 26,000 cases. This is the history, the epidemiological tracing that was done from the original infection. A child of two years age developed fever, black stool and vomiting. It died very quickly within uh, a few days, you can see, in December of 2013. That was the first recorded case. 
They were able to then trace infection through sisters, the mother, the grandmother, the nurse, the village midwife who then spread it to another family, and then it spread throughout this village, Guekedu in Guinea, and on and on and on. And this went on for several months before anyone figured out that it was Ebola virus, and that's part of the reason why this spread so extensively. Uh, it eventually spread throughout Guinea, Sierra Leone, and 28,000 cases as well. But this is a kind of a great example of how you can trace how the infection went. The transmission is with, by contact with infected blood or body fluids from someone who is sick or has just died, contaminated objects is not transmitted by insects, water, food, or aerosol. So not these long-range aerosols. However, if you are intubating a patient and the patient sprays large droplets right in your face, and you don't have face protection, it will infect you. So the droplets are technically going through the air, but that's not what we consider aerosol transmission, not these long-distance aerosols anyway. It, the virus enters your mucosal surfaces, breaks in your skin, it can get in by contaminated needles, and we find virus all over the place. Skin, body fluids, nasal secretions, blood, semen. Incubation period, two to 21 days, you are not infectious during the incubation period. So if you come to the US having acquired it in, say, Africa, and you don't get sick till you're in the US, you won't have infected anyone else. There's some of the early symptoms the, in the peak illness, you have the typical hemorrhage, convulsions, lots of metabolic disturbances, coagulopathy. And as I said, the case fatality ratio in Africa is quite high. Many systems are involved. The virus seems to replicate in many places. The systemic symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, respiratory symptoms, problems with circulation, neurological problems. This is amazing. The virus is hitting every major system, and it causes cell death in many different cell types. It infects lots of different cells, so it has a broad tropism, it causes elevation of liver enzymes, it's destroying liver cells, massive lymphocyte death as well. We think not only does the virus infect in and kill cells, but it makes lots of inflammatory mediators, cytokines and chemokines. This activates immune cells, which is in part a major cause of the disease. Really a remarkable infection. And remember, this is a dead end. Once we control the outbreak, that's it, until there's another spillover from a forest source. You may remember that back during that last outbreak, a few cases came to the U.S. There were four cases. Two in Dallas came from Africa. They got sick in Dallas. They were admitted to the hospital. And there were two locally acquired infections in nurses in Dallas as well because they weren't using proper containment procedures. They weren't taught proper containment procedures to deal with the patients. And I think this is a great example of how every infectious disease is everybody's problem because here in the U.S., every, politicians were saying, this is not our problem. We don't need to spend any money on this, but it is our problem. And you can see it came here to the U.S., and it could have been a lot worse. We were very good at containing all the other cases that were, that were imported in. Because of this outbreak, we had a number of Ebola virus vaccines that were ready to go, but never tested because there was not money. The army in particular was developing Ebola vaccines for use in, in case there was a use of Ebola as a bioterrorist weapon. And so during this outbreak, they put those into testing and were able to get some good results on uh, at least one of those vaccines. But it makes you wonder what other viruses should be, we be preparing for, because Ebola had been around since the 70s, so we could see it was highly fatal, so it's an easy case to make a vaccine. But what, what other ones should we be looking at? Let's talk about the coronaviruses. There are two. The first is SARS. There's a website called ProMed Mail which is a very interesting place to look at communications about infectious diseases. This is an email from this doc in 2003 who said, have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a chat room lives there and reports that the hospitals have been closed and people are dying. So this is 2003 
This is when China was very secretive about what was going on in their countries, especially infectious diseases. They are much better now, uh, especially in terms of influenza outbreaks, but they didn't want to tell anyone when they had this issue, and that facilitated its spread globally. So this was a new fatal respiratory disease, severe atypical pneumonia that began in November of 2002, 300 cases, five deaths, short incubation period, fever, chills, headache, et cetera. 10 to 20% of these people may require uh, mechanical assistance in breathing. So this virus was isolated from some of these individuals called severe acute respiratory syndrome virus and eventually is found to be a coronavirus. Just before this outbreak, Hong Kong issued a um, poster that says, Hong Kong will take your breath away. And then I think within a few months, they, uh, the SARS outbreak. So they were really correct. It did take your breath away. And then, unfortunately, a Chinese doctor who had treated some patients in the original outbreak, he went to Hong Kong, stayed at the famous, now famous Metropole Hotel. Because of this outbreak, it's famous. You can see it up there on the right. He died a day later after checking in to the hotel. But he managed to spread the infection to 10 people who then flew off to all sorts of places, and they, in turn, spread it as well. So it's a kind of a tragic situation where he should not have left China. And by doing so, he spread the infection. Eventually, 8,000 people in 29 countries. This has 10% mortality rate. Here's the epi curve for the outbreak, the onset here, the peak. Uh, it ended in July 2003, mainly because we restricted travel globally, especially from China. We isolated people at airports, so they had fever scanners installed at airports so that you could pick up people with fevers and not let them leave the country. And this probably contributed to stopping the outbreak. So globally, there were 8,000 cases, uh, again, spread from China to other countries you can see here and it's had about a 10% case fatality rate. As I said, the virus is a coronavirus, and early on, meat markets, open meat markets, were implicated in the transmission of this virus. This was a new infection because serum collected before the outbreak were seronegative, but the early cases were in handlers of animals for the exotic trade, and these individuals had higher levels of antibodies to the virus than control groups. And what we realized eventually was that the virus, SARS coronavirus, is in bats. And these bats probably contaminated civets, which are animals that are brought into the meat market and sold. And a number of people bought them and acquired the infection that way. And then, of course, it did go person to person for some time, but it petered out. And whether, as I said, our interventions did that or, or there was some other reason, we're really not sure. We have not seen it since. But there are lots of bats in China with ver viruses very similar to these circulating. People have been looking for them a long time. And who knows when there will be another outbreak. More recently, 2012, a second coronavirus emerged. This is first seen in a 60-year-old male who died in Saudi Arabia in September of 2012 of pneumonia and renal failure. The virus was recovered. The genome was sequenced. It showed it was a coronavirus. The, the receptor was identified very quickly and shown to be not SARS coronavirus, but something different. This virus has caused 1,952 cases to date. The vast majority, as you can see, in Saudi Arabia. Some have been exported to other countries. There was one traveler who went from the Middle East to Korea, was hospitalized, and he spread the infection within a hospital setting. But the main numbers of cases are here. Some have gone to Europe, other parts of Africa, even a few in the US. These are all travel-related cases. They seem to originate uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. What we know now is that these infections, or most of them, were probably acquired from dromedary camels. Those are the ones with one hump, and these Camels are endemic for the virus throughout the Middle East and East Africa. People have taken sera and looked, and these camels are all infected. And when a new camel is born, it gets immediately infected. The camels have some respiratory symptoms, but for the most part, they are okay. But in these parts of the country, people eat camels. They race them. 
They farm them. They do all kinds of things that we don't do because we don't have camels here. And they get infected. And that's where a lot of these infections have started. However, not every infection has an apparent camel source. So we don't know what's going on there. The virus probably came from a bat at some point. But when it went into camels, we don't know. We have some old specimen of, from camels, serum from camels, which tell us that the virus has been around for decades. But when they got infected, we don't know. It's mostly very sick people who develop this infection with other chronic diseases, but not a lot of people are infected. It doesn't transmit well from person to person, and whether it's going to change or not, we don't know. At the moment, there is a camel vaccine that is being tested, which seems to work well for camels, and that's probably what will be done. Another one health solution, because not everyone is at risk for MERS coronavirus. I don't think I told you that MERS is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. So yeah, vaccinating the camels should take care of that. We also have some antivirals that have been developed. So it's a different risk factor. Here, in SARS, it was an open meat market. Here it is camel husbandry. And I just want to go back to Zika virus, which we have mentioned multiple times in this course, because it again illustrates a virus that's been around and we've known of it and it changes its epidemiology kind of like polio. With SARS and MERS coronaviruses, we'd never seen them before. With this virus, we knew in 1947, this was isolated from a monkey in the forest in 1947. And for 50 years, we saw evidence of infection with Zika virus throughout Africa and Asia, but no outbreaks. It wasn't until 2007 there was a big outbreak on Yap Island when most of the population, 8,000 people, 73% of them were infected. And that is because the virus was probably introduced into a naive population. It's spread by Aedes aegypti, mosquitoes. There were a series of outbreaks in the Pacific Islands. And then, of course, big outbreak in Brazil in 2015. And that's why people started paying attention to this, because associated with that outbreak were cases of congenital malformations in children born to mothers who were infected with the virus. And that had never been seen before. So here was a virus that didn't cause any epidemics, like polio, suddenly started causing epidemics, and then it was associated with a new syndrome. And of course, what do you think was the first thing suggested as a hypothesis to explain this different behavior? It was mutated, of course. I don't think it mutated. I think it was just never introduced into a serologically negative population as big as Yap in Brazil and so forth. And then we began to see syndromes that we'd never seen before. But this is an emerging infection because pre-2007, it had one pattern and post a very different one. By the way, right now, there are very few cases of Zika. And I think it's because you only need a certain low percent of people to be immune in a population to stop spread. Because right now, we're not seeing any uh, in Brazil. So how common are, are all these things? As I said initially, it's pretty rare to get an established virus in a population. Dead ends are very common. The ones that produce sustaining transmission, very rare. You may say, but all the human viruses are emerged, right? And yes, you would be right in saying that because at one point they came from our ancestors or an animal. But if you count all the virus infections that we talk about, that we know about, there aren't that many compared to all the viruses out there and all the encounters we have. So I, th I think they are very rare. Impossible to predict what the next one will be. How would you do that? I mean, for Zika, for example, people have said, well, there are 10 other viruses in the world that we know of that are related to Zika. They're flaviviruses. They're mosquito transmitted. They infect animals. Maybe these could be the next global disease outbreak. Sure, it could be. But there are lots of other viruses out there as well. You really cannot make any predictions about which one is going to be next. But I do think we can know what's out there. I think knowing all the viruses that exist in the world, or as many as you can get, will help you to see the diversity and be prepared. It's all about preparedness. You can know what's out there, and you can have a system in place so that if there is an outbreak, 
you can contain it so you don't let doctors who took care of cases fly to Hong Kong and spread the infection. That's what I mean by preparedness. So knowing the viruses out there, I think, is going to really help. Now, we have one more emerging infection to talk about, and that's AIDS, of course, caused by HIV. We're going to talk about that next time. It gets an entire lecture to itself. The only virus in this course that gets a lecture to itself because it is really the biggest of all emerging infections. <laughs>